Carl, I just listened to Taylor's podcast, and I'm afraid that playing any game prior to 2021 breaks my verisimilitude. So unless we're playing a modern-day, current-day game or a future game, I'm going to have to drop out of all those other games because it it just doesn't make any sense that, you you know, the technology and the, the world's not there. I can't play any past games anymore. Sorry, Carl. And no, we can't say it's fiction. It's made up because cyberpunk is an alternate history that diverts from our history, which is why the tech is different. So it's no different than a fantasy game. So I'm going to have to drop out of all the fantasy games because it breaks for some verisimilitude. Sorry, man. everyone and welcome to another episode of the Geomologist Presents. Um, it's been a slow gaming week. I was unable to attend some games and some of my games got cancelled. Um, so yeah, no recaps this week except for one. So I will share that later on in the show. And it's pretty cool that I was able to play in this game. I may run something tonight. Today is Saturday, the 23rd of October. And Amy and I might continue our Arkham Unveiled campaign for Call of Cthulhu. So we'll, and we were playing something about some adventure with zombie children in it. And we will probably continue that. So uh, we'll see how that goes tonight. We have some, some chores to do at the house. And then we'll see how we feel after. Um, so in response to Jason's comments he is responding to some comment that i quipped about in i think taylor's clerics were ringmail podcast and i said well it's hard to get into a cyberpunk 2020 when it's already happened and our technology is better now than it gives in that game and i honestly i guess if i were to run that cyberpunk game I would set it in 2077, and then we could do all the fantastical cybery things, um, cybernetics, advanced robotics, um, virtual reality that takes place in that cyberpunk game. I think the authors were being optimistic when they just said that in 2020, it's going to be like X. But at the same time, anachronistically, that game doesn't have smartphones, so, you know, I think I would like I would update the technology like they did in in Shadowrun in fifth and sixth edition, or I think maybe as early as fourth edition, where they're like, okay, we're not going to have wires and and punk rock hair um, to jack into your, you know, find a node and jack in physically to a place. You can do it in the virtual reality world and explore nodes in virtual reality, a la Snow Crash. Um, as opposed to what they did in up to third edition. But apparently some people don't like that change, even though it makes more sense with our technology. And that was my kind of quibble. And Jason took it uh, took it to extreme and quibbled on the quibble. And that's probably the trouble with quibbles is that they keep, um, they populate, just like in that Star Trek episode. Um, but as... B.J. Boyd stated in the Auto Dungeon Discord, right, he didn't think it was a good idea. There are topics that keep coming up. People won't let them go. They're practically cling on to them. And as we all know, quibbles hate Klingons. So thank you for that, B.J. I think you won the internet that day, or at least that channel in the Audio Dungeon Discord. Yeah, so the trouble with quibbles is that they keep going on, and I probably should have dropped it, but, you know, it scratches at the back of my neck sticks in my craw that uh things aren't the way i want them to be but hey it's not my game right i mean jason could say the same argument for twilight 2000 that hey that didn't happen we broke the wall gorbachev wasn't assassinated um 
et cetera, et cetera. And that's the code of the change in that game, right? Just like when you read uh, Man in the High Castle by Philip K. Dick, the big change there is that FDR was assassinated and couldn't bring the U.S. Uh, to a conclusion in World War II. Or, well, the U.S. entered World War II too late. Um, and, uh, well, the Nazis in Japan won, which is alternate history, right? So I should have taken it as an alternate history. Um, so now Jason's going to drop all the games because since I don't believe in that verse or that breaks my verisimilitude, it translates to him breaking his verisimilitude. So all our verisimilitude is broken and uh, the quibbles populate. Poor Klingons. Well, uh, we'll be more positive, maybe. Oh, we'll see Joe Richter kind of piles on and uh, we'll see what he has to say next. Yo, Carl. So, question, man. Did I hear you say that someone who read the player primer for Forgotten Realms, you called that person a cheater? Do you think that's cheating to read about the world? See, I don't think that's cheating. These characters live in the world. They probably know stuff about the world. I don't, I don't know, especially if it's called a player's primer. You know, the Pathfinder Adventure Path, they come out with a player's guide before each Adventure Path, or most of them. And the players are they're supposed to read it. It gives them a basis, a, a setting. It grounds them in the setting. So, yeah, I don't know, man. We're, I don't know if that's what you said. I might have misheard. So, what do you think? Is someone who reads about the world that they're playing in, are they a cheater? Peace out. No, someone who reads about the world is not a cheater, but it depends what they read. So in a lot of these books, there was always, you know, what the players know, so common knowledge, which is great. And then what the GM knows, so like GM secrets, I think they always had like a GM secrets section. And a lot of players would read the GM secrets section, maybe thinking they would run, which is okay. But then you have to kind of throw out that knowledge when you play. And especially in like a an infinite game right where hey i've been running forgotten i tell i tell or i've told the players hey i've been running forgotten realms for a while so things that my players did in first edition and second edition are going to hold true here in third edition um etc so um of course fourth edition screwed all that up you can listen to bj boy talk about the plague blah 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 that fourth edition had um in his latest uh, episode of the arcane alienist Wow, BJ, that's twice I mentioned you in this game. I'm glad that uh, you're keeping up that positivity because these quibbles have honestly really got me down, you know? Um, and I know it's all tongue-in-cheek, but if you have a hard week at work, you know, it kind of translates to what goes on in your um, leisure life. So, yeah, it's kind of bummed that I didn't get to play games that I wanted to play in because of various circumstances. Um, and that... Uh, you know, people who I think are my buds can't take a joke, or maybe I cross the line in joking. So no, just to reiterate, it's not cheating. I think what gets annoying, though, in circumstances like this as well, in my Forgotten Realms canon, this was, didn't exist, or this didn't happen, or this was like this, but like I already told you guys, things have happened in this world where there might be changes because it's my Forgotten Realms, not your published Forgotten Realms. So uh, there you go. And I, get, I guess that's why I like games. There's a couple games just to... Like, I think Ebron, the world setting Ebron is very good at this. We start 10 years after the big giant war that happened. Everything else is your own Ebron. And I don't know if they changed that with the 5th edition Ebron stuff. I can't remember maybe they made it 20 years after i'm not sure but i'll have to look at that but i remember ebron why it was appealing is that we're not going to change there's no meta story we're not going to change what's going on from this point on and i like that same thing with harn world too and hard harn world is nominally system agnostic and you can run any um role set with it i've run harn master 
uh, various incarnations and also the Riddle of Steel, which really worked, and I'd love to get back to that. So Burning Wheel would work just as well, too. They have 5e hacks. They have like a um, a harp hack for Harn World. Harp hack for Harn World. That's kind of fun to say three times really fast. But um, yeah, so Harn, it, not, it stops at 720 in their dating system. And after that, it's your Harn World. And that's kind of what I prefer because then you don't get into arguments Joe, and maybe that's what I was passive aggressing to, um, that in the past players have done that and argued, well, my, my player primer says this, so that shouldn't be happening in this world, right? But then what if you import, you know, like what if you take a Greyhawk adventure or a adventure originally set in Greyhawk and then put it in the realms? What if you take like a big um, adventure path like Night Below and put it in the Forgotten Realms, where it originally was, I think, in Greyhawk, right? Maybe. Um, I think that was also, like, world agnostic. But um, so then, right, you port these things in, and they don't gel with what is normally in the, what is in the normal books or in the world books, right? And there have been, there are those gray books from first edition, and then they had the second edition books that fell apart, and then they had a third edition bind, big bindy brown book Forgotten Realms, and then they had a fourth edition Forgotten Realms, and I think all the new D&D stuff is all from fifth edition is set in the Forgotten Realms, right, for the most part. So there's a lot of canon on the realms, and players need to let GMs, and I think you would agree, Joe, players need to let GMs make it their Forgotten Realms or their insert published world here, and that's why I prefer games where they don't have this meta plot. Um, and maybe that would inspire me one of these days if I had the time to make my own world um, or set a game in my own world. So, you know, and, and then Forgotten Realms, like we had the world books, but there wasn't, I really didn't run published adventures. I mean, I would put a smattering of a dungeon here and there, um, but then a lot of times it's just what the players wanted to do. Or, you know, we have like a setting book and you go down and see what happens when you go down into Undermountain or something, right? So not really an adventure, but just setting books that give you adventure hooks. I don't know. I don't know, one of these days. Maybe in the past, maybe in college, I should have started my own world in my own campaign, but I don't know. I always like the published stuff. So there you go, Joe, a long answer to your quibble about what I said. Um, so maybe we can squash this quibble and not feed it grain uh, to upset all the Klingerons. One more thing on XP for gold, which again, I'm not against. I think it's kind of cool. But here's another scenario. What if you go into a dungeon, no traps, no monsters, and a whole shitload of gold? <laughs> then how does that work in world? Again, I, I realize that a dungeon master would never do this, right? This is purely a hypothetical. Because my question isn't about whether or not it's a good system, because I think it's an interesting and cool system. But my question was more about how it how it works in the fictional world. So yeah, that's the situation. You walk into a dungeon, you don't do anything, and you get a shitload of treasure. <laughs> how does that work? Peace out. Yeah, I don't know, in a case like that, or if that seemed to be a regular occurrence, um, I think it would be hard to get to that situation that you had, but it is hypothetical. I've had players steal treasure when the monster was not around. Um, like they, but then they, they, they waited, right? Like, oh, there's a big giant living in there. Let's just wait and see when the giant leaves and then we'll go get it. Or, you know, they break into a, a vault or they travel into the dungeon. Uh, that's part of the effort. But in a situation like that, where they just take gold and just sitting there, well, maybe I know there are some systems where it says in order to get XP for the gold, you have to spend the gold. So then you would have them, they wouldn't get XP at that point when they got the gold, but then when they go carousing and spend it all, then they get the XP. So then therefore they're interacting with the world and influencing the world and buying shit, right? So I think that's what I would do. But um, yeah, I don't, you know, it's a really interesting discussion and something that can help. I know it definitely helps in the older editions of the game to get the players up to 
a survivable level because they're pretty squishy at first level, right? Um, but then it again, my biggest thing is that it, you know, other than, I don't know, maybe maybe Wizards is going to change, and apparently, in their latest offering, the Witchlight Fey stuff, you can essentially solve the adventure by not fighting. So they're going to give you XP and milestone XP for overcoming challenges without fighting. But that has generally not been the case with Wizards products. In my observation, it usually is um, XP for monsters. And that's the driving force and ambition as for all the players to cut off heads and collect trophies. And I, I know that Paizo with their Pathfinder stuff has been doing overcome for XP in a nonviolent manner for a long time. Um, and now Wizards authors are finally catching up, or maybe they're finally using a lot of those freelancers, right? So, um, yeah, so I think that's, a, that's a, a great observation and great idea. And now it gives me ideas myself on how to maybe set up that scenario. And then again, maybe the gold is cursed if it's that easy. And part of the XP is getting rid of the gold to pass on the curse. But is that the way you solve the problem? No, it's you. You're now working for the bad guy. Great idea, Joe. That's the next adventure. And now for something more positive and totally different. I got to play finally in one of Andy Goodman's Call of Cthulhu games, and I was able to jump in to their campaign of the Two-Headed Serpent, a pulp Call of Cthulhu adventure. Um, midway, I don't know if it's midway, honestly. I have the book, but I haven't really looked at it, except glancing maybe at the first you know, to table of contents. So I, I don't even know what's going on in this adventure. All I know is my character, who I think I had a pretty cool concept for a character. My character is jumping in um, mid campaign when they're in Iceland. Um, so there, that's probably the, hopefully the only spoiler I give. I'm going to talk about my character and my interaction with the other players. Mainly, um, it is a game, like I said, ran, run by Andy Goodman of the Grizzly Peaks and Grizzly Peaks Radio media super empire and also playing is nikki who has just started a podcast infiltrating the bro sr and i'll put those links in the show notes if i remember the other two people i don't think have podcasts but uh, they were super fun to play with um i felt it was very welcoming which was really cool my character is um and I will let me go look. I need to go pause it and go look at the actual character sheet to see what his name is because it's kind of long. My character's name is Amaruk Nukilik Igi Masusuk Trangwalpluk, or Amar for short, or Amar for short, depending on where you are and how you pronounce it. And he is uh, of mixed ancestry. He is part Inuk, Inuit, and Danish. He is the unrecognized son, or he is a son. He is a son out of history of the great Danish explorer Peter Freusen, and uh, he is older than the real life children of Peter Freusen at this time, who are only seventeen. And he has gone with his father on various expeditions to Greenland. He was there in twenty six. When his father had to cut off his leg um, and he does admire his father but there is a love-hate relationship that it was fun to to kind of explore in there uh, he feels his father is a sellout for the movie that is that he produced the previous year we're in 1933 i believe that is what andy told me so it was cool so um amar uh, joins these creatures uh, joins the players while they're in dipl diplomatic relations with these creatures uh, the group accepts him because he is there to find the missing villagers. He kind of was, the way Andy introduced him is he kind of, there's an earthquake. He's in Iceland, there's an earthquake. Um, he gets knocked unconscious while he's in this village. 
Um, and then when he wakes up, uh, the people are missing and gone, including his, his friends. Um, so he goes and follows the tracks and catches up with the players. So, so it was pretty cool. Um, it was, it was cool. It was, it was good. Um, we, we did some diplomacy. We, uh, found a way to cross this abyss and there was all the tension that there was something large down in the abyss. And we crossed into this space that we um, might have been held by by the enemy of the that the players had developed or learned about um, through the course of their other adventures. So it was kind of fun for me to to go straight in, um, and and then hear all these people. Go, oh, and you remember what happened in Peru? Or yeah, if you had been with us in Borneo, you know that kind of stuff was, was pretty cool. Um, and he's a little behind the curve and even behind in his, uh, um, yeah, he's, he's behind in, you know, what they know and of course in skills and stuff like that, but it's, it's cool. It's, it seems like it's going to be a fun campaign, a fun character to play. And Andy has these little parcels of two hour blocks. So we play for two hours and see how far we get, which is actually very cool. So um, I really enjoyed the group, enjoyed the game. I feel like I have to step up my play game. And um, but it was very enjoyable. And so, yeah, you'll hear like snippets like this. Um, I'll try to be as spoiler free as possible. Um, if you Two Serpents has been out for some time, so you may have already read it if you're a Call of Cthulhu fan, especially the pulp. I think it was the first big campaign for Pulp Cthulhu, other than what was in the Pulp Cthulhu book. Um, but Andy has done Disintegrator, which is on his um, Grizzly Peaks radio. I think episodes one, two, and three are out there. And I don't know when Two Serpents will be out. But hey, now, now I'm a big star on Andy Goodman's uh, Grizzly Peaks radio with uh, other, other cast members, which is very cool. So... Um, it was fun. Um, I, Andy runs a very tight Call of Cthulhu game, which I appreciate. Um, mine is a little sometimes loosey-goosey, and maybe I need to pick up some strategy and learn some stuff. But um, we each have our different styles, which is not a bad thing. And I like that he keeps the pace going. He lets us interact. We did have a lot of cool interaction. Um, I think I need to practice my Danish accent more. Um, when I tried it, it came out like, a Polish partisan. Um, so I got to figure that out, but it was cool. People get into character, um, with either their American accent or, um, I think one of the players is from India. So he has like a slight, you know, uh, Indian, uh, Indian genteel accent. Right. So, um, so it's pretty cool that, that people get into it, which is what I enjoy. So we're in the, in the belly of the beast looking for our friends that have been that were taken from the village. We've seen some weird things. Um, I've lost some sanity. I think I lost like eight sanity during this game. Um, and uh, we're, I guess, diving into madness as it should be in a Call of Cthulhu adventure. So um, the night when we pick up next, we're going to go right into a fight. We found this strange, marvelous technology, scary, horrific technology, and now we're being confronted by some of the adversary. Um, so we'll start with a fight next time and it should be very cool. I think that'll be all for now. Again, you know, I couch my episodes around recaps and there wasn't much play this week, which is okay sometimes, I guess. And one's a little bummed by it, but you gotta go forward, keep moving. And, uh, yeah. So I think I, I want to, I don't know if I'm changing the format, but I want to add some more content that seems to be more interesting. I mean, we have these sort of blog-like back and forth discussions, but I might get someone to come in with me and discuss some aspects of our hobby that uh, are interesting or controversial or have come up when I've been playing. So that'll be coming soon. And uh, without, well, 
I'll just thank uh, my callers, Jason Connerly and Joe Richter. And uh, thanks uh, for listening. And I'll thank TJ Drennan for the music. Take us out, TJ.